In this exercise, I've saved my progress as glowingdragonbug.psd, and now we're going to begin applying our smart filters to this smart object. So if you're following along with me, make sure the top layer, Dragonfly, is selected here in the Layers panel. Bear in mind that the Dragonfly creature here is in front of the blurry leaves, so it must by necessity be outside of our plane of focus as well. So it's got to be blurry too. But whereas we blurred the leaves using the lens blur filter, we're going to have to seek a different solution this time around because if I go to the filter menu and choose blur, lens blur is dimmed. The reason being it's just basically too computationally intensive to be applied to a smart object. It has to be applied directly to pixels. So I could open the smart object and blur the pixels using lens blur if I wanted to because it's a very powerful blur function and it does a great job of simulating real out of focus objects. However, a close second and much quicker and more flexible because you can apply it to a smart object is Gaussian Blur, which is actually an incredibly useful feature inside of Photoshop. If you loaded D keys, I've given it a keyboard shortcut of Shift F7. That'll bring up the Gaussian Blur dialog box. You can see that the dragonfly is dutifully blurring there. And I'm going to take the radius value up to 5 pixels. So the higher you go with the radius value, the more blur you get. Now, this isn't really enough blur. If we were going to apply it by itself, I would take this value much higher. I don't know if I'd go as high as 15. Yeah, maybe. That looks pretty darn good, actually, right there. However, I want it to be able to survive a little bit of motion blur as well. So I'm going to take that value down to 5 pixels. And if it's not really, truly, exactly as blurry as it should be, I'm not going to worry about it too much as long as it conveys the concept that I needed to inside of this composition. So anyway, 5 pixel radius, click OK. Now notice I get this filter mask right here. And that allows me to determine which portions of the dragonfly I blur and which I don't. For example, if I clicked inside of that filter mask and I went over here and got my brush tool, let's say. And let's go with something that's more of a hard brush like this one. 45 pixels actually should work out pretty nicely. And if I were to paint with black, which is currently my foreground color, so that's good. If I were to paint with black inside of the filter mask, like so, then I'm going to reveal unfiltered portions of the dragonfly that are in focus. However, here's the thing. I have no desire to do that. In this case, I don't need a filter mask. So instead of having it there dangerously seeking my attention, so I might actually use it, or just cluttering up my layers panel, I'm going to right-click on it and choose Delete Filter Mask like so, just to get it out of there. Now, you can always add it back. And you might imagine you do it by right-clicking on Smart Filters, which is what you do, and then you choose Add Filter Mask. So it's very easy to introduce a filter mask if you need it later. We'll be talking more about that when we take a close look at smart objects inside of Photoshop. Anyway, I'm going to press the M key now to return to the Marquee tool. And now I want to convey some motion to the creature to make it look like it's speeding by, which of course it would be because it's a very fast dragonfly. I'll go up to the Filter menu, and I'll choose Blur. And I'll choose this guy right there, Motion Blur. And I want to try to simulate the angle of the dragonfly. I have no idea exactly what that is, but probably right about here is good. So something like negative 67 degrees. And I'm just trying to match this line to the angle of the dragonfly. If you wanted to, Photoshop's got a measure tool that would help you out. It's available from this eyedropper tool slot right there. But negative 67 degrees is probably close enough. And then I'm going to take this distance value up to 40 pixels. So there's a lot of movement going on. And then I'll click OK. So th the idea is we shot this image when we were on the planet of Pandora. We captured this image with a very fast shutter speed. But still, the insect was moving by so darn fast, he's still pretty blurry. All right, and that is the dragonfly so far. We need him to glow more, though. Notice he's got kind of this dark patch in his body, and I really want a, a vibrant glow to come off this creature. And we're going to make that insect glow in the next exercise. In this exercise, we're going to make the dragonfly glow by applying a filter called Lens Flare. And it's a real old-school filter. It doesn't provide much in the way of a preview, which is why it's so useful to apply it as a smart filter, because that way you can see the effect after you apply it, and you can change your mind. So let me show you what that looks like. I've gone ahead and saved my changes as blurfilters.psd. 
and I have my top dragonfly layer selected, as you can see. Now I'm going to go up to the filter menu, and I'm going to choose render, and I'm going to choose lens flare. And notice that the lens flare filter does not provide a preview out here on the larger image window the way Gaussian blur and motion blur did. Instead, we just get this little dinky preview right here, which is very difficult to gauge. But anyway, notice that you set the center of the lens flare effect. And by the way, lens flare is supposed to simulate the effect of a light shining into the camera's lens element and then reflecting around the lenses. It's something that you try to avoid like crazy when you're capturing a photograph. Hey, but you can apply it in post in Photoshop. Anyway, you click inside this preview to specify the center of the effect, which is the light source itself. And this would be great if I wanted to simulate a different light source that was casting light into the lens and onto the insect and so on. But I instead want the insect itself to be casting the light. So I'm going to click for now on its tail because I really don't know what I want at this point. And I'm going to set the brightness to 150%. You can play around with that, make it brighter or less bright, whatever you want there. And finally, you can select a variety of lens. And you will see a little preview of the effect if you switch from one to another. But for now, I'm just going to stick with the default setting, which is 50 to 300. And I'm going to click OK. And then I see my effect. And I go, gosh, that's dreadful. That's not what I want at all because it's way too bright. And we have too many of these ringlets. And of course, I'm lightening up the entire image. And as a result, I can see where the dragonfly image drops off, where that layer ends. And I don't want that. So I want to change things up a little bit. And in the old days, you would have had to press Control Z or Command Z on a Mac. And by the old days, I mean back before there were smart filters. You would have to just undo the effect and then reapply it and see how it worked and then undo that and try again. Nowadays, what you can do is just double click on lens flare in order to open the filter back up because each one of these smart filters is editable. So double click on lens flare. That brings up the lens flare dialog box. And as soon as you start making any changes, like I'll switch to a 105 millimeter prime lens, there's a good chance that you'll see the preview disappear inside the image window. Right now, I'm still seeing the old preview, not the new preview, mind you. So you're not really previewing the effect. Oh, there it went. It was just kind of hanging out for a while, I guess. And now you can see, as soon as that screen changes, you're losing the preview. Don't think it's updating on you. You're just losing it. All right, now I'm going to click right here, I think, next to the bug's shoulder, like so. And I'm going to take that brightness value down to 120%. So those are my settings for now. Click near the head, 120% for brightness, 105 millimeter prime for the lens type. Click OK. And now we'll see what that looks like. And actually, that looks pretty darn good. The problems are that we've got too much in the way of ringlets uh, hanging out here. And I don't want that. To me, that's just a little bit too cute. And I also want this tail to drop off. And finally, I want to really punch home the brightness of this animal here. And we'll be doing all of those things in the next and final exercise.